Hey everyone, today's video is basically one that I wish I saw before I pursued my aviation career. And it is the things that I wish I knew, or the, the questions that I didn't know to ask before pursuing an aviation career. Let's get into it. So the first thing that I wish I understood better about an aviation career is the medical certificate. To fly for an airline or professionally, you need a first class medical certificate. And I had a history of ADHD and I had a short bout of depression where I was feeling down. I did what you're supposed to do. I went and talked to somebody, got help. Um, everything that was making me feel down is hugely resolved and that's never coming back. But the FAA really has one way of handling depression and one way of handling any history of ADHD, even if I was already off medication, um, but I basically had to test out of it and it was a very long, very expensive process. I had faith in the system. And I did get my first class medical, but the part that I really didn't know is that the difficulty and the expense would be ongoing. So every year to renew my first class medical, I need to see a expert doctor that's approved by the FAA and expert doctors time is very expensive. So a about 30 minute uh, video call now that I've seen the doctor and we have a, um, relationship, I guess you could call it. A uh, 30-minute video call is about $2,200 every year to renew my first class medical certificate. And I had faith in the system that I would be able to get a first class medical. I knew that I could fly and that I'm safe and healthy, but I did not know that it would be such an ongoing endeavor and such a financial hardship continued. I thought once I got it, I had it, just renew it every year, no big deal. But that is not always the case. So if you're starting out in an aviation career or thinking about pursuing that path, get your first class medical certificate first before you even start flying, before you even shop for flight schools, because it's not very expensive to go to a AME doctor and get your um, physical and hopefully you just get your medical. But if you have some of these more complex things in your history, uh, leave time for that. Mine took 13 months from the time I first saw a doctor to when I actually got my medical. And I plan to make a future video kind of outlining that whole process for anybody that does have ADHD or any type of uh, depression in their history, in their record, uh, how I navigated that and kind of things I learned along the way. Second thing, that I wish I knew about the aviation industry is how much self-teaching there would be. Almost everywhere at this point is saving you time and money by giving you an online course that you're gonna take and watch these videos at home and that's gonna give you the information. You're also reading textbooks, um, different flight schools have supplemental information on top of that but you are basically teaching yourself this content. And this works pretty well in aviation, the way the flight school system is just about everywhere. And I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more on my um, next couple things, but it works well. Just know that you need to have the discipline to sit down and get through some pretty dry content sometimes and you basically have to teach yourself. So know that it's gonna be lonely. You're not gonna be hanging out with instructors or with a class of other pilots and they're gonna be teaching you and spoon feeding it to you. You really have to take charge of your education and train yourself 
and get it done and show up to each lesson prepared for what you're doing that day because the airplane is not a classroom. You really can't learn very well while you're flying an airplane because you're already distracted and maybe if you're new to flying, kind of on sensory overload, so you're not set up for success to learn something new even if you have a great instructor with you. So learning it at home is not a bad thing, but again, know what you're in for. It's a lot of self-teaching and self-study at home. The next thing I wish I understood better, people, people have told me, but aviation is a seniority-based industry. And I heard that a lot and I was like, yeah, that's cool. But I didn't really get, a, I feel like a more accurate way of saying it is it's kind of like a pyramid scheme. There's lots of people at the bottom trying to climb the ladder. There's flight school students, then there are the CFIs that are teaching them and building their flight time, which is paid for by these flight school students. And then once those CFIs get enough time to get to an airline, they get 1500 hours, they're building their time to get that, to that point. They're gonna be first officers at an airline flying you know, smaller regional airplanes and then maybe they upgrade to captain or they upgrade. Um, I never, I didn't go to an airline, so I can't speak to that process. But as you climb this ladder, obviously you're making more and more money, but it is all fed by all of the people at the bottom. So like every one CFI is flying with two, three, four, five people a day to build that flight time. So there really needs to be all of these flight school students coming in for the whole system to work. And that's kind of how a py pyramid scheme works is the people at the top get their payoff as long as more and more and more people flood in at the bottom. And it's not a bad thing, but know that you're gonna be paying your dues for years in this industry before you are making good money or maybe truly happy with where you are. There's lots of good things at each point along the way if you consciously look for that, but if you're conscious if you're always constantly thinking about the next thing and you're not going to be happy where you are, it's going to be tough for a long time. So just know that going in. This is a career. This is not a fast, you know, these fast track programs, they'll get you in and they'll save you time, but it's still a long road to turn this career into an actual career, laying this foundation. And uh, I didn't fully understand how the whole system worked and what it looked like and what a reasonable time frame was to think uh, as a CFI to get 1500 hours, how long that may take or what kind of sacrifice or commitment that may take or what the lifestyle might look like to do that. Number four on my list, CFI hourly pay. This was probably just me not knowing what questions to ask or being naive, but before I started my training, I talked to the flight school owner where I was doing my training and where I planned to teach, and I asked what the starting hourly pay was. It was $20 an hour. For some reason, I pictured that was like clock in in the morning, clock out at the end of the day, $20 an hour. The reality at the school, and from my understanding, it's industry-wide at most schools, all schools probably, is that you're paid handshake to handshake while you're with a client and teaching. And if they cancel or no show, or if the lesson cancels due to weather on a bad weather day, um, if you have a gap in your schedule, you know, you might not have complete control over your schedule. The place that I was, we worked with the clients directly to do our schedule, but also lessons would get put on the schedule, especially for newer pilots before you had that relationship to schedule with them. And it would happen. There'd be gaps, usually right in the middle of the day. It wasn't like you would just start later and have some time off in the morning and not have to be there. You'd be there, you'd have a gap, and then you'd have another lesson that if you left, you'd have to come back for. 
and maybe not enough time, you know, if it's one lesson block, which was about three hours at the school I was at, it's tough to like go home and come back with that amount of time. But um, yeah, when it's not clock in, clock out at $20 an hour, and it's only when you're with the clients, that's a significant difference each day, or it can be sometimes. So each day turns into weeks, turns into months, and I wasn't making what I thought I was going to be making as a flight instructor. And uh, that, again, is probably on me of not knowing what question to ask or being naive about what I thought it was and wasn't. But I thought it was hourly. <laughs> Feel free to laugh at me here. One thing that I was able to do was creatively find other work I could do for the flight school when I wasn't teaching. So I leveraged my photography and video experience, especially my experience mounting cameras on the outside of aircraft, like on, I have done on hang gliders for years. And I was flying with GoPros on the airplane. I looked into what the regulations were for that. So I could kind of not really double dip, but like wear a different hat and create work for myself during that, what would normally be downtime. But if you don't have creativity like that, you, you're going to have to find something else or just plan for it. Know that there will be periods in your day that you're not getting paid for. And what you think you might be taking home each day or each week might not be what you think it is if you're expecting a punch in, punch out kind of job. I wish more flight schools were this way as kind of an aside because what that system bred was when people weren't with a client, they were not so quick to do anything really productive or helpful. And some of them were like, that's not my job. I'm not getting paid for that. And they were very open about that. I was kind of the other way. Like I wanted to make the place better and I would sweep floors or take out the garbage or help a student who was kind of there doing self-study planning for their lesson and their instructor wasn't back yet and they were checking the weather and stuff. I, I, I was there to teach. So whether I was really getting paid for it or not, I was trying to make the place better and I was trying to teach, but it is kind of tough when it feels like charity and that, that system of only getting paid while you're handshake to handshake with the clients, you need to know that going in. And I didn't. So number five on my list, things that I wish I knew or understood better is how much there is to learn about becoming a pilot, even a private pilot, that it's not flying an airplane. That sounds crazy, but I thought it was going to be a whole lot more about flying and aerodynamics and understanding how this airplane works and how to handle the airplane. And that's maybe 10%, probably not even 10% to, to tell you the truth. Uh, airplanes are very stable, very easy to fly. I'll, I dare say they're easy to fly, especially compared to hang gliders. But what you're going to learn are the legal requirements and reading the regulations, you're almost getting like a minor law degree, learning to speak FAA language, read and navigate these regulations, read these interpretations of rules that maybe had some ambiguity and then a interpretation was published on that. Learning where to look for all these things, even knowing to look for all these things is a huge topic in itself. On top of that, you're going to learn about your airplane or each, each airplane you fly. If you fly more than one airplane, eventually you'll fly other planes. And even at the private pilot level, you're expected to understand how the engine works, the different parts of the engine, the systems of the airplane, like the electrical system, any mechanical systems that are there. You really need to be able to explain how these things work, because if anything does malfunction, you need to be able to identify what's malfunctioning and then what to do about it. And you don't want to act inappropriately because you don't understand what's even happening. So there is good reason for that. Um, on the topic of mechanical, you're not going to have to learn how to be a mechanic because there's a whole different license for airframe and power plant mechanics to work on airplanes. But you do, you do need to learn 
how to determine if the airplane is airworthy or not and legal to fly or not. And some of that involves going through the log books and understanding what's required and what has been done or what needs to be done. And that all falls on the pilot in command. So you're learning quite a bit about maintenance and the mechanicals of the airplane and all the different systems. Another part that you have to learn a lot about, which makes sense if you think about it, but medical factors and the human body. So you're gonna learn about common ones are hypoxia. If you fly too high or you maybe you have a medical condition where you're, you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain, basically, and in your blood. Um, anemia can lead to that. You're gonna learn um, dehydration. There are some things about night flying where you learn how the human eye works to better understand your night vision and how your eye adjusts to dark light and what you need to do, what you can do to make your night vision better or protect your night vision while flying at night. And there, there is a bunch of stuff that you're gonna learn it's not really a medical degree, but you're going to learn a bunch about the human body that you probably didn't already know. And you wanted to learn to fly a plane. Maybe you didn't want to know about the human body and how it works, but you're going to learn it. Another part is airspace and not just airspace, but how to read sectional charts, how to read where the airspace is and the different requirements for different airspace. And kind of going along with that, but communications. So communicating on the radio at a non-towered airport where there is no control tower is very different than talking to an air traffic controller at an airport that has an operating control tower. So when you start learning airspace and the different types of airspace, you're going to learn about the different types of airports and you're learning these different ways of communicating and it's just, it's a whole bunch where flying is honestly the easy part. And then the last thing, the biggest thing when it comes to flying and anybody that I know through hang gliding isn't gonna be surprised by this one, meteorology. You are going to become a weatherman. You're gonna learn not just what is the weather doing today, tomorrow, the next day, but why is that happening? You're learning the cause and effect. You're learning about weather systems. You're learning how to read weather charts. You're learning how to decipher winds aloft. And some of these are not super straightforward. It's not like you can just turn on the weather channel and have the, that blue screen forecast about today tell you what's gonna happen. You're looking at charts, you're looking at hour by hour, you're decoding raw data that gets published every day from weather balloons. Uh, it's, it's honestly a lot, especially if you don't already fly hang gliders, paragliders. If you're not used to meteorology, it is a huge subject. And obviously it's very important when you're flying because that's the medium that you're flying in. And airplanes can fly from one place to another. You can start in one weather system and fly to a completely separate weather system or through a weather system and then to something, even a third completely different set of weather on the other side of wherever you're going. So it is a huge topic. It is super important, but you can expect to be learning a whole lot about that. And even coming from hang gliding with my flying background, I was really surprised how much of all these things that I had to learn and study and how much I didn't know about these things just to become a private pilot before I did the instrument rating, which is a whole lot more about weather. Um, but that really, that really surprised me and how little there was about flying. I was a little disappointed because I love flying. I wanted to learn more about flying and a, a new type of flying to me. And airplanes just are really, pretty straightforward to fly. Flying, honestly, is the easy part. The commercial limitations. So when you go through training, first you get your private pilot license, which lets you fly an airplane in the United States, but not for hire. You can fly with other people and split the costs, but you always pay your share. Then you can get an instrument rating. You can fly under instrument flight rules, file a flight plan, maybe fly when the visibility isn't good enough. Um, depending on what the weather is and what your airplane's capable of. But 
then you get your commercial certificate or you start training for your commercial certificate. And when you start studying commercial, you learn the limitations of the commercial certificate. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is a short list you can look up of exceptions of things that you can do with a commercial certificate and get paid for in an airplane. But by and large, what the commercial certificate is letting you do is get paid to pilot an airplane only. And I say it that way because if you have an airplane or rent an airplane, your friend can't pay you to take them somewhere or to go pick something up and bring it back. Because if you're providing the airplane and the pilot services, you're providing carriage of persons or property and you become a operator, not just a pilot. And there's a whole separate certificate you need to get. You need an operator's certificate. So there's this short list of things that you can do as a commercial pilot, like flying skydivers, aerial photography, aerial tours within 25 miles of the airport that you start and finish at. You have to start and finish at the same airport. There's a couple other ones on that list, uh, but really you get your commercial certificate and you're still not hireable for a flying job. Between that and a lot of flying jobs, the insurance companies require way more hours than what it actually takes to get your commercial certificate. So if you think you're gonna do something besides flight instructing, you might be surprised when you get your commercial and you're like, I'm a commercial pilot, I can get paid to fly. You can legally get a job and fly, but it's pretty tough to get hired as a, as a low time commercial pilot. And if you think you're going to buy or rent a plane and do something on your own, no right now. Commercial certificate does not let you do that. Learning to fly airplanes has really been distilled down to a color by numbers approach. Almost everything for almost every airplane, your instructors are going to help you with a like a procedure and an order of operations. And it's do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And each thing is quantified. So like you're flying the traffic pattern around the airport, practicing takeoffs and landings. And at each stage along the way, there's a specific power setting for that part of the traffic pattern. And you know, it might be by manifold pressure or RPM, depending on the airplane that you're flying. Uh, but everything is by the numbers and it's like a formula, it's like a recipe. And there's very little room for creativity or interpretation in that. Again, this isn't a bad thing because standardizing everything, if you do it the same every time, generally that gives you the same results every time, although that's not always true. And I do find that when you read accident reports, that can be something that catches up to people as they do it the same every time. They didn't recognize this time was different. It needed something different, but that's a different topic. Learning to fly is essentially a colored by numbers. The upside of that is anybody can do it. Again, airplanes are surprisingly easy to fly and learning to fly. If you can learn a recipe and learn how to cook, you could learn how to be a professional pilot. It is a much more approachable career than people think it is. And you just have to be able to study. It takes discipline more than anything else and just building good habits. And if you can do those things, you can fly an airplane professionally. Probably something that isn't gonna surprise some people, but it surprised me a bit. The cost of airplane ownership. As I was teaching students and, you know, there's different types of students. There's professional students looking to become instructors, build time, get to an airline. And then there's people that want their private pilot certificate. They maybe want to get a plane and be able to travel, but fly themselves on their own schedule uh, to different places. And I was, I was teaching some of these people and then it was like, you know, I have all of these privileges and I've learned all of these things. And especially compared to hang gliding, airplanes are so much easier to share the joy of flight with people because you can just go to the airport, take your airplane out, hop in, go fly around. You sit comfortably in a cabin. You can have a conversation with each other while you fly around. And hang gliding is missing all of those things. So 
I was like, this is really cool. It would be great to get a plane and be able to do this with my family, maybe go on short trips, but even just to fly around for fun. And I started airplane shopping and I was pretty crushed to learn that airplanes that are older than I am with very basic equipment and engines that are getting close to needing an overhaul, which is like 60 plus thousand dollars, um, they're still like $80,000 up $120,000 for very basic Cessna 172s, Piper Cherokees, you know, just basic four seat airplanes. And again, they're older than I am. I did not expect an airplane to cost that much. The upside is that airplanes hold their value pretty well. So if you buy an airplane and keep it in good condition and maintain it, you can probably get back most of what you purchased it for. You're not going to get back your maintenance costs and maintenance is not cheap on airplanes. You're not going to get back your tie down or hanger fees that you paid while owning the airplane and you're not going to get back your insurance costs. So with all of those things, owning an airplane is something you really need to be passionate about and you to make that financial sacrifice, it's got to be something you really want to do because it's going to hurt you. You're going to be living on cans of soup if you're not well off so that you can have an airplane and fly. And that freedom might be worth it, but it's a lifestyle and it may not be for everyone. So if you're training on a professional career, maybe it's just work for you, but I can tell you the more you fly and the more you grow your skills and your experience, you become very capable. And this thing that seems amazing and far away of personal aviation suddenly feels within your grasp, except that if you're working as a flight instructor, you are not making nearly enough to own your own airplane. Maybe like a very slight partnership, maybe renting once in a while. The school I was at had a, a really generous program that you could fly the airplanes owned by the school just for the cost of the fuel. So fill it up when you're done and bring it back as long as the plane wasn't booked. The problem was reserving the planes at a busy school because they're booked all the time or they're in for maintenance and the other planes are booked. So it was a little bit tricky and not quite as good as it sounds, but it was very generous and, and I appreciated that the school that I was at did that. I think this is a huge one and I didn't, I didn't give this any thought before I started and I think people really need to consider this. Are you willing to relocate? Are you willing to move? Are you willing to, if you have a wife and kids, are you willing to go away for a while or uproot the whole family to a new location, to a place that you probably don't want to be and wouldn't choose to be other than to pursue this career? And again, you don't have to relocate, but for the, the flight training centers to get the jobs that you're going to be looking for, you know, even at the CFI level today, there are so many people that have heard about this pilot shortage and pursued this career. There are a lot of CFIs, flight instructors out there looking for work, probably more than there are flight schools. So the school that I was at, um, there was a guy who had came up from Georgia and was working here in New York because that's where he got the job. So when you're looking for work and you're looking for a place with airplanes that are maybe more desirable to fly or clientele that are, you know, if they're training professionally, they tend to be more motivated, um, fly more often. You know, you're looking for busy schools. Maybe you're looking at a place with more consistent weather, more reliable weather. So you fly more and get more time as a CFI if you're time building. But all of these things, depending on where you live, it's probably not in your backyard. I was pretty lucky that the school that I picked is pretty good and it was nearby. But part of why I picked it was because it was nearby. The last thing that I was just really surprised by is Airplane engine technology just seems really antiquated to me. You, to start an airplane, almost all airplanes, you have to prime the engine. So you're turning on a fuel pump, you're opening the throttle, 
or the mixture control, you're manually controlling the mixture control of how much fuel to air ratio you're having. And you're priming the engine before you start it to get the cylinders going. And it's just this very mechanical, um, manual system to get an airplane started. And once you get the hang of it, it's not that big of a deal, but in a day where I'm, I'm almost 40, every car that I've ever been in, you turn the key and the car starts. You didn't have to pump the gas. You didn't have to prime anything. And then to get in airplanes, even new modern airplanes, there are very few where you just turn the key and it starts. I, I did train and fly in one and it was really nice and I got kind of spoiled by it. And then getting in some of the other planes and doing, you know, um, like a hot start where maybe there's some vapor lock and the plane is just hard to get started. And it's like, why does it have to be this way? But aviation in general is very reluctant to adopt new technology and engine technology in particular. Um, you know, every time you start and shut off the engine, it was just a reminder, like it just feels kind of antiquated. On the other hand, it's robust and reliable. So it's not a bad thing, but I was just, I'm still surprised by that. You know, the, the one plane that I was flying that had the turnkey start was really cool. It was great. Other than if it gave you ECU codes. That's another story for another time. The last thing that I wanted to mention, it's not really one of my things on my list, but there is like this bonus effect to becoming a pilot, especially if you follow it through to the commercial level. It affects the way that you think about things and the way that you approach things. And for me, you know, I grew up hang gliding. I was already flying. I already very much considered myself an accomplished pilot, but formal aviation has a way of thinking about things where it's where am I and what am I doing right now in the moment? And then where am I going and what do I need when I get there? And pre-flighting everything and planning ahead, always being one step ahead. And that carries over into the rest of your life in ways that I would have never predicted. And I wouldn't have believed it if you told me. But becoming a commercial pilot, even if you don't go to an airline and become a commercial pilot, I will say it will improve your performance or your capacity to do just about everything else. A good friend of mine says that everything is cross-training for everything else. And man, is that true. So becoming a commercial pilot will make you better at just about everything. It just formalizes the way that you think of things. Even you go to make dinner at night, you're going to pre-flight what you have. So you have all the ingredients already and you're going to leave yourself time to go to the store if you have to, if you were missing something. And that's just the way that you think as a pilot. And you do it so much to get to the commercial level that while it's very formalized at first, it becomes habit and then it's less formalized and you're just doing it without realizing you're doing it. But I can tell you it is pretty cool. <laughs> so that's my list. Things that I wish I knew or understood better. Uh, maybe you can't really understand these until you get in and you're in the industry, but I hope I tried to, I tried to explain them in a way that it's more than just telling you about it and try to help you understand before you get in what you're getting yourself into, what to expect. Again, none of these are, are bad things. They're not deal breakers. I would still recommend if you're interested in an aviation career that you should do it. But I think they're things that people should know or should consider um, before getting into it. So again, if you appreciate this video, if you liked the content, Give me a thumbs up and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.